So the next speaker is Francois Legal. So the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. So I will talk about distributed quantum computing. So I will start with a brief description of classical distributed computing. So we consider a network represented by a graph with n nodes. So each node represents a processor and each edge represents a communication channel. For technical reason, we assume that all nodes have IDs, distinct IDs. Sorry. And each node initially knows nothing about the topology of the graph. And we have communication, but communication is synchronous. It means that communication occurs round by round, and at each round, nodes can send one message to their neighbors. So let's see an example here. At round one, you have all the nodes exchanging messages. Then you have local computation. Then another round of communication, then local computation, and so on. And we are mainly interested in the number of rounds needed to reach a conclusion. Okay, let's see a concrete example, computing uh, distances. Assume that you want to compute the distance between node one and node six. So the answer is two, because there are two hop, the distance is two here. So how do we do this? So node one first send a message to its neighbors. And then all the nodes will receive a message, know that they are distance one from this node one. And then all the nodes, the second round, all the nodes uh, tell the new knowledge to their neighbors. And at the end of round two, all the nodes that receive for the first time a message know that they are distance two from node one, so they can update the distance and set distance equal to. Okay, you see for this problem, you can solve it in two rounds. So now I describe briefly the model, but there is a very important thing, which is the size of the message here. And there are two different submodels. In the first one, we assume that its message is very small, only one bit. In the second model, we assume that there is no restriction. We have no restriction on the size of the message. It can be very, very large. And so the second model, the local model, may look a little bit artificial, but actually it's even more uh, well studied than this one because it's a, it has a lot of motivation. Many practical situation, communication is very fast and cheap. And what's really the bottleneck in the computation is the number of rounds needed to compute, uh, or to solve a problem. So now the quantum version, I will give more details later, but uh, in a few words, it's exactly the same, but now we can send quantum message. So typically we assume that we don't have any prior enter. So each edge is now a quantum channel and you can send quantum message. And again, there are two sub-models, a congest model where uh, you can send only one qubit per message and the local model where there is no restriction on the size of the quantum message. And the congest model is very related to communication complexity because uh, since each message is very short, the number of runs relates to the overall communication complexity. And indeed, there are several known examples of quantum advantage, typically polynomial speedups obtained recently in the quantum congest model. For the local model, on the other end, there are very few results. And this talk focuses on this local model. Okay, so now I will give more details about uh, this, local this local model. So typically we consider a bounded degree graph, that is a graph where each node has degree upper bounded by a constant, and the node do not receive any input except the IDs, and we want we typically want to solve a problem related to the whole graph. So for example, computing a coloring of the graph. Okay, and the classical deterministic algorithm will work as follows. So initially, you don't know anything. The node know nothing about the topology, except, of course, the ID. And after one round, they learn the, to the labels of their neighbors. After two runs, two, they learn the neighbors of the neighbors. And after three runs, the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors, and so on. Okay, and you can actually show easily that this is the optimal strategy for classical deterministic algorithm. Okay, with all the subgenerality, you can always assume that uh, 
R round classical deterministic algorithm learns first its R op neighborhood and then compute the output based on the knowledge they get. Okay. So this means that for classical deterministic algorithm, the number of rounds needed is equal to how far do you need to see in order to solve a problem. So we have a very nice characterization here. And indeed, this can be used to prove tight bounds on the classical complexity of many problems. And a very uh, basic and fundamental problem in the local model is three coloring rings. Okay, so you have a ring here, and here is a three color ring. So three color ring means that we color, we need to color each node by one color. There is only three colors available. And the condition is that uh, neighbors should have distinct colors. For example, you have green here, and indeed the two neighbors here have distinct colors. And it's known that in the deterministic local model, the classical local model, a three color ring can be computed in log star n rounds. So what is log star? Log star is defined as this, but it's not the definition that's really important. The very important thing is that it's a very slowly growing function, extremely slowly growing function, much slower than log, 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 and so on. So for example, the log star of this big number is fine. It's very, it's not constant, but very close to constant, right? Okay. And you may wonder what I'm talking about three coloring and not two coloring. Indeed, if n is even, a ring will have a two coloring. But the point is that computing a two coloring of a ring is very difficult. It requires a linear number of uh, rounds. So it's not a very interesting problem in distributed computing. The three coloring version is much more interesting. Okay, so now the quantum local model. Okay, so again, uh, the difference is that now we can send one quantum message between adjacent node per round, and again, the bound, the, the length of the message is unbounded. So if you consider this simple network, a pass of a four nodes, at each round, you can, the nodes can exchange messages. We can rewrite or interpret a quantum distributed algorithm using a quantum circuit, and sometimes it's useful. So for example, if you have, sorry, so if you have a zero round of communication, nothing happened. So you simply do local computation and measure. Uh, if you have one round, then you have communication. So you have one additional layer. So this, this box means uh, exchange of the register, quantum register, and then we measure. So if you have two rounds, we have two additional layers and uh, three rounds, two again additional layers. And so Okay, so we will use this interpretation of few minutes. And of course, the main question in quantum distributed computing is to understand we, whether we can get an advantage, a quantum advantage. And in the local model, we know that this is the case. There are two prior works. We know that there exists a computational problem that can be solved in constant rounds in the quantum setting, but requires a linear number of runs classically. So these results improve the previous one versus two. Now it's a constant versus n, a very huge gap. But there are two, so, so first, what problem is it? Uh, it's simply sampling from the outcome of a quantum circuit that measure graph state in a random basis, okay? So in a constant number of rounds, we can construct the graph state corresponding to the whole network, and then locally the node can measure the graph state in a random basis. And we can show that simulating something from the same distribution requires a linear number of rounds in the classical setting. So there are two weaknesses. Uh, the first thing is that this computational task is not really useful. And the second one is that the solutions are not efficiently checkable. Checking if we we have a valid sample requires actually a linear number of rounds. And you see that the situation is very similar to quantum supremacy results. There are many papers on quantum supremacy with circuit that typically show that a weak quantum circuit can do things that a strong classical circuit cannot do, but also we have the same weakness. Typically it's for very artificial problems, something problems, and it's very hard to verify the supremacy. Okay, 
So the really interesting question are the following two questions. So can we prove a quantum distributed advantage for a problem that someone actually cares about? Or can we prove a quantum advantage for a problem that is efficiently checkable? And this is open, widely open. OK, let's come back to this recoloring. So it happens that this problem is efficiently checkable. It's very easy to check if a candidate is a three coloring because each node only needs to compare its color with the colors of the two neighbors. This can be done in one round. Okay. And classically, we know how to do it in log star n rounds. So the fundamental question, one of the most fundamental questions in the field is whether you can do better. So for example, whether you can achieve constant round in the quantum setting. And this question uh, is open and has been asked in the very early papers on quantum distributed computing. OK. So actually, almost all the problems studied in the literature on uh, the local model have the same property as three coloring. They are locally checkable, which means that you can check if the solution is a valid solution in a constant number of rounds. So we can refine a little bit the question and ask whether we can prove a distributed quantum advantage for a problem that is locally checkable. And this is a question we are considering in this work. And so I've talked with many people uh, working on classical and quantum distributed computation. It seems that the natural conjecture is that the answer is negative. So if you, re you require the problem to be locally checkable, then it seems that uh, it doesn't, um, be, uh, there, there is no uh, quantum advantage, at least in the local mode. And this work try to make progress on this conjecture. OK, and we do this by introducing the concept of uh, causality. OK, so you all know that quantum mechanics satisfy causality. So what does it mean for quantum distributed algorithm? For example, for this uh, two-round uh, algorithm, if you look at the output of this node, the, top, the bottom node. So the output only depends on the input within the like cone. This means of the input of these three nodes. So more generally, for any quantum distributed algorithm, you can have some relation between the input and the output using causality. And we can go further and define the concept of non-signaling algorithm. Okay, the key idea is to define a model so that that it can do anything, anything except violating causality. And this has been done in prior work. And here is the definition. So for any set of nodes X, so the yellow nodes here, if you take any, if you take, if you consider the blue nodes here, which are the blue, the node at distance at least R from the orange node, so any change in the blue node does not influence the output distribution of the orange nodes. Okay, so any probability distribution satisfies that property is called the R op non-signaling distribution. And you see that we are talking here not about algorithm, but about distribution. Okay, so non-signaling distribution, probability distribution. Okay, so we have three models: classical quantum, and non-signal. We don't understand what, well, quantum distributed algorithm. We want to understand this better, and we want, would like to try to prove or disprove this conjecture. But the point is that we can understand fairly well the classical algorithm because we have a nice characterization. And we may be able to understand well non-signaling algorithm also because it's essentially uh, related to probability theory, to classical probability theory. So a natural approach to solve this conjecture will be to show that for any locally checkable problem, non-signaling algorithms are not more powerful than classical algorithms. This will prove that classical is equal to non-signal. And since quantum is between, this will prove that everything collapses. And this will prove the conjecture. Okay, 
And this has been like proved actually, this thing has been proved for two color ring in rings. We know that non-signaling is not more powerful than classical for two color ring in rings. We also know, this was yesterday's talk, that uh, the same thing for graph coloring in arbitrary bipartite graphs. But what we would like to know in order to prove the conjecture is to show the same for any locally checkable problem. And in this result, in this paper, uh, our main result states that actually this, national, this natural approach doesn't seem to work because there exist many classes of locally checkable problems for which non-signaling algorithms are much more powerful than classical algorithms. Okay? Of course, we have a positive interpretation of this. This means that actually there may, there might be a quantum at the advantage at the end. So it's even more exciting a perspective. Okay, so now I will give a slightly more um, precise description of uh, the main result. So actually in the paper, we consider many models. So in the introduction, in the introduction of the paper, we have this uh, figure with a lot of models, both classical and quantum, and we prove a lot of relation between all these models. But in this talk, I focus on the model related to quantum, which is a quantum model, the classical model, and the non-signaling model. And our main result says that any locally checkable problem that can be solved in small or log n rounds in a deterministic local mode. This means here, any locally checkable, prob checkable problem that can be solved with this complexity in this mode. Then it can be solved in constant complexity in the non-signaling mode. Okay. And we have one example, which is a three coloring in rings. Classically, I say it's a log star. Log star is a big O of log n. So you get constant complexity here from the theorem. But for three coloring, it was already known. So there was a few papers by mathematicians showing this. So it's not new for three coloring rings. But our theorem says that it is true for any locally checkable problem with this complexity. Okay, and this means that the natural approach to solve the conjecture does not work for a very large class of problems, all the problems with this complexity in the deterministic setting. And as I said, this positive interpretation is that there might be actually a quantum advantage. And the second result is about trees. So the first result was about network of arbitrary topology. The second result is about network with topology uh, corresponding to a tree. So we show that in tree, any locally checkable problem that can be solved in small or log log n runs the non-signaling model. So here, non-signaling model, this complexity can be solved classically, even deterministically with this complexity, much smaller complexity. So what does it mean? This means that in trees, there is no local, locally checkable problem with locality in this region, in the quantum local mode. Why? Because if there is complexity here, this means that the complexity is smaller than log log n, and you can use the CRM to get complexity here, much smaller complexity. So we know with the CRM have a much better understanding of uh, the complexity of problems in the quantum local model, over three at least. Over three, there is nothing in this region. It can be here, there is something here, something here, but nothing in the intermediate region. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I will try to give an overview of the proof of the main theorem. Again, the main theorem says that if you can do something in smaller log n in the deterministic setting, you can do it in constant complexity in the non-signaling model. And we use two tools. The first tool is from the prior works I mentioned uh, earlier. It says that there is a constant round non-signaling strategy for three coloring a ring. And the second tool says that there is a reduction from prior work from the blue thing here. So any locally checkable problem that can be solved in 
log n round in the deterministic local uh, model to the problem of computing a d plus one coloring of the graph, where d is a maximum degree of the graph. And based on these two tools, we prove the CRM by using the following four steps. First, we extend the result of tool one from a ring to a coloring, what we call a pseudo forest. A pseudo forest is a generalization of a tree. Then we show that any bounded degree, gra any bounded degree graph can be as a nice decomposition into pseudo forest. And then we combine one and two to obtain a D plus one coloring for any graph of maximum degree D. And finally, we use the second tool in order to uh, obtain as a claim of the theorem. And all these things are a little bit technical, but the main insight here is really this tool one. So I will spend the last two minutes uh, describing this very, very nice uh, non-signaling strategy for three coloring a ring. Okay, so we consider the following probabilistic process. We have a ring. We first put at the uniformly random position a uniformly random color, say, for example, here. Then I put a different uniform color at a different position. So say, for example, here. I put blue here. And then I repeat the following. I pick a uniformly random node between consecutive colored nodes. So for example, let's say this one. And I insert a color different from the two colors of the neighbors here. So it would be a green here. And you continue. Say I take this one and I put it in orange. Then say I will take this one and it will be blue. And you continue like that. Okay, and if you continue like that, what you will get is a valid three coloring of the graph. It's obvious to see. So what this probabilistic process is producing is a probability distribution over valid three colorings of the ring. And now the surprise is this theorem that says that the restriction to any sets of vertices at a distance greater than two are independent of each other. For example, if you take the set of this set and this set, the distance is at least two, it's greater than two. So uh, these marginal distribution are independent. We can show this, it's fairly surprising. And from this property, we can conclude that we have a one hop in our definition to become the two here, become a one hop non-signaling distribution. So you get a constant round non-signaling strategy for three coloring a ring. Okay, so it is the main uh, technical result used in our proof. So I will conclude now. So uh, we have shown several relations between the classical quantum non-signaling local models and also many other uh, things that I didn't mention in the talk. And the main message at this for the quantum community is that for a large class of problems, it's not possible to exclude quantum advantage by using non-signaling arguments because non-signaling strategy are extremely poor. But of course, again, it's positive interpretation is that there might be a quantum advantage. So the main open problem is to try to find a problem exhibiting a quantum advantage. The second one is maybe to exclude quantum advantage, not for all problems, but for one specific problem. For example, we can try to focus on three coloring in rings. And the last one is to understand whether shared entanglement help for any local, locally checkable problems. This is an open question. OK, thank you. Yeah, we again have time for one or two short questions. Um, <clears throat> so in general, what is the complexity for locally checkable uh, problems? Is it always like log star of n or is it larger, smaller? Uh, it really depends on the topology. So classical, so for classically, if you consider a ring, 
The situation is very simple. We have only six, three classes, classically, constant, log star, and linear. Okay? And depending on the, on the topology, you can have more classes. But there is typically only a constant or small number of complexity classes. And most practical problems have complexity very small. Log n or log star n, we are really very, very low in uh, the complexity for many practical problems. Okay, can I ask another question? So for, uh, you know, in the end, you show the, uh, I don't remember the name, the, um, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, the last the last algorithm you show, like, I understand the uh, the fact that you have a light cone in the conclusion, but the algorithm itself doesn't seem to have any light cone property there. Like you do things at a global level of the graph itself. So yes. I'm yes. confused. Yes, yes. So it's not an algorithm, actually. It's a strategy. That's why I, I use strategy and the distribution. So the point is that what we call non-signaling distribution, non-signaling strategy, doesn't mean that we have an efficient way of generating the thing. Okay, it simply say there is a probability distribution, that probability distribution, and it satisfies this, prob this uh, property, which means that uh, you have a non-signaling property in when you look at the marginal of this probability distribution. It does not say anything about how to generate it concretely from the uh, input. But we know that the complexity here is an upper bound on any quantum distributed algorithm. Okay, I see. So you just need the existence of something. Exactly, like exactly. Thank you for the talk. So, I mean, I guess on that note, I was curious, what are a couple other examples of problems in this model? Like you mentioned the uh, colorings on rings, but I'm wondering what other graph problems are, um, you know, studied in this area. Yes, so as I just mentioned, so if you consider rings again, there is only three classes. So a log star will be all the problem equivalent to three coloring. We will have constant, which are all the trivial problems. And we will have n linear complexity, which are all the problem equivalent to two coloring of a ring. So over a ring, really, uh, we have only three class of problems. And when you get to more complex uh, topology, you can get more, uh, a few more um, problems. But typically, we have only a constant, as I just said, a constant of small number of classes, and each class has one uh, representative problem, and everything becomes. Uh, uh, you can reduce everything to this a uh, few numbers of the proxy. Very interesting. And do those uh, classes, t do those representative problems tend to be coloring? Uh, often coloring, yes. Are there any counterexamples? Uh, yes. So, so you have problems like uh, computing a good orientation of the graph, think less orientation of the graph, and things like that. Yes. There are a few other problems, but uh, coloring is by far the most uh, important problem in all this uh, theory of locally checkable problems. It's a very interesting model. Thank you. So uh, let's uh, postpone the discussion for later, and let's thank Francois again for this really nice talk. <laughs>